Hey folks, so today I'll be continuing my series on the classics and for today's video I'll be covering two players, uh, Johannes Zuckertort and Joseph Henry Blackburn. So I've decided to cover these players together because uh, they were two of the best players in uh, the later part of the 19th century, the 1860s, 1870s, and 1880s. Uh, they had kind of a similar attacking style, and they were two of Steinitz's main opponents. Of course, Steinitz referring to Willem Steinitz, the first official uh, world champion. So starting with Zukertort, who was born in 1842 in Poland. Uh, Zukertort was a pretty brilliant player. He was one of Adolf Anderson's students, arguably uh, Anderson's greatest student, and it's rumored that they played around a thousand games, maybe over a thousand games uh, with each other, which really shows in terms of Zukertort's uh, style. He definitely liked to build up his positions, but more often than not, he would try to rely on combinations in order to win games, and this was kind of his belief that a chess game had to be won through some kind of mating or brilliant tactical combination. Zuckertort had quite a bit of success in tournaments. Uh, his greatest uh, achievement winning the London tournament in 1883, uh, where he scored 22 points out of 26, ahead of players like Steinitz, Blackburn, and even Shigorin, who would later become one of the world's uh, best players. Actually, this first example comes from that tournament, London 1883, and this is a game Zuckertort won over uh, Blackburn, in fact, that would later become, I, I believe, one of his best known uh, combinations and something that is truly remarkable. So here in this position, uh, playing white, we can see that Zuckertort has kind of developed in his... Uh, classic system, uh, the Zuckertort system that he's known for, which typically starts with either d4 or knight f3, and then ends up with white developing the bishops to often d3 or e2, and the second bishop to b2. So here white plays the move f5, a uh, very strong attacking move. The basic idea is try to put pressure on the pin along the e-file and open up black's king. If g takes f5, bishop takes f5, the G file would open up, uh, allowing Rook G3 check, and the six pawn is, of course, a huge target here. So this would, would not really be playable for black. Instead, black played the move knight to E4, which white considered uh, the critical defense. He was committed to playing bishop takes E4 here, D takes E4. Uh, now, perhaps the first star move of the combination, F takes G6. Uh, because this move, although it does look natural to simply take a pawn and try to open up black's king, does allow the move rook to c2, which makes it seem like black is just about to win a piece, as the double attack is going to force white to leave the bishop on b2 undefended. If black were to just take back hg, this would not be critical at all. White would go rook to g3 and simply open up an attack along the g-file, try to push d5 soon, open up the bishop, and black's king would be in huge trouble on the dark squares. Uh, so Blackburn, of course, takes up the gauntlet and plays the move rook to c2. White plays g takes h7 check, and black decides to go king to h8. I think this was a pretty important move. In case of queen takes h7 or king takes h7, this would simply allow white to start an attack with rook g3 check, rook h3 check, followed by bringing in the queen, and of course we can forget about the bishop on b2. Black's king would just be mated by the heavy pieces. Uh, but Blackburn plays king h8, which is a, a much better defense, using white's h-pawn as a kind of shield. White pushes d5 with check, black blocks the diagonal with e5, and here comes the, the truly brilliant move of the combination. This one kind of had to be foreseen in advance, otherwise, looking at this position, it would appear that white is just about to lose the piece on b2. It doesn't have a way to develop a mating attack against black's king. Uh, but here comes queen b4, a move that's uh, truly remarkable to see. Of course, hanging the queen and basically trying to deflect black's queen away from defending this e5 pawn. The main point of white's combination is if black takes the queen on b4, white will play bishop takes e5 check. Black's king is now forced to grab this h7 pawn, and white's bishop and two rooks are actually able to coordinate well enough to deliver an immediate mate. White would start with rook h3 check, black's king has to move to the g-file, Rook g3 check would follow. Black's king is forced to move somewhere to the h-file, uh, but it doesn't really matter. For example, in case of king to h7 here, white would play rook f7 check. And then after king to h6, bishop f4 check. This is kind of the key check that is going to help white in all lines, forcing the king down to h5 and allowing white to checkmate with rook h7. 
So basically black is getting mated in all lines here and was not able to take the queen on b4. But of course, since white's queen is attacking black's queen on e7, black also doesn't have time to take the bishop on b2. And so here white's attack goes from promising to absolutely crushing. Uh, black played the move rook eight c5. There was really nothing else to suggest. At this point, white had a few good options. For instance, queen takes e4 was already quite strong, but Zuckertort continues in uh, the most stylistic fashion, rook f8 check. Now the point of this sacrifice is after queen takes f8, uh, again, the pawn on e5 is hanging. White plays bishop takes e5 check. King takes h7 is forced. And after queen takes e4 check, this time white's bishop, queen, and rook coordinate perfectly to deliver mate to black's king. The rook is coming in soon, and black is not going to be able to survive this. So after rook, H8, rook f8 check, black played king takes h7. This followed with queen takes e4 check, king g7. Bishop takes e5 check, forcing black to take the rook on f8. And now the final finish, bishop g7 check. Uh, if king takes g7, then of course white picks up the queen with a check and will then uh, mate black using the rook. And in case of queen takes g7, then of course we have queen e8 uh, checkmate. So the game uh, concluded with king takes g7, queen takes e7, black simply resigned here. So a really, really uh, fantastic combination. This one uh, is one of the more famous combinations in, in chess history, of course crowned by this move queen b4, which absolutely stunning and, and just so, so beautiful. Uh, another game of Zuckertorts that I really liked uh, was played against an amateur uh, back in 1877. And uh, here in this position, black played the move knight to h5, which is definitely a very questionable move, but with a reasonable idea, just attacking the f4 pawn and the f4 square. And here, Zuckertort comes up with another really, really brilliant combination. Um, now, I would say that his combination is not totally necessary, like already white could win very easily with the move bishop takes f7 check. This is a pretty simple tactic that I think most players are aware of, especially when we have this pin uh, where black's bishop is targeting white's queen, but on the other hand, white's queen is potentially targeting black's bishop. Uh, after king takes f7, white has knight g5 check. If the king moves away, white will simply pick up the piece on g4, and white will have won a pawn and just has a completely crushing position. And if bishop takes g5, then after f takes g5, white has opened up the rook to give check to black's king and will win back the piece next and completely winning. So this was probably the simplest way to win the game for white and, and punish black's last move, um, but it was not nearly as nice as Zuckertort's idea. Uh, he decides to go f takes e5. And now if black were to just recapture this one with the pawn, then absolutely bishop takes f7 check would follow. And, and this one is even stronger with white's rook ready to join the action. So instead of black, of course, played knight takes e5, putting a little bit of pressure on the pin and also covering uh, the f7 square. And now comes the queen sacrifice, knight takes e5. Uh, this is very reminiscent of the famous uh, Legal's mate or Legal's trap where white hangs the queen on d1, but is able to launch a mating attack with bishop takes f7. Now the original uh, Legal's mate was actually pretty simple. That was a bishop takes f7 check, black's king is forced to move up to e7, and then knight d5 is like immediate mate because black's bishop is still on f8 and, and stopping black's king from escaping. But this one actually has a little bit uh, more detail to it. Here after bishop takes e1, bishop takes f7 check, Black's king is forced to uh, go to the f8 square, and white decides to first grab the knight with a check. Uh, if black's king were to go to g8, then white would play bishop f7 check, forcing king to f8. And now I think the simplest win would be this nice move, knight d7 check, forcing black's queen to take this knight, putting the queen on a light square, and setting up a simple winning discovery with bishop e6 check, where after king e8 takes takes, White picks up the bishop on d1 finally and will end up with an extra piece and totally winning endgame. Uh, instead of king to g8, after bishop takes h5 check, black decided to block with bishop f6. Uh, and here comes the fantastic point behind of white's play. I mean, at this point, white is down a queen for a couple of pieces, and it's not clear that white is going to be winning everything back. Uh, but after rook takes f6 check, another just fantastic sacrifice, uh, things soon do become clear. Uh, so the first point here is that if queen takes f6, knight d7 check will just win back the queen. And again, white will have a ton of extra material here. Uh, instead, black played g takes f6, and here comes white's point, bishop h6 check. 
Uh, now after king to g8, we have simple bishop f7 mate. So black is forced to play king to e7. White goes knight d5 check, king to e6. And here white mates with a really nice finish, bishop f7 check. This kind of had to be foreseen ahead of time and, and calculated well in advance. Otherwise, again, white was risking to just uh, be down a queen with no mating attack. But everything does work out for white in the end. Uh, black plays king to takes e5. Now would actually be a good time for you guys to pause your video if you like a simple tactical puzzle, simple in, in quotations, uh, <laughs> white to play and win. What would be the fastest way to finish off black's king? Okay, so the obvious move would be to start with bishop f4 check, and I believe this one does win, although it does uh, allow black's king to escape a little bit longer. Instead, much stronger is the quiet move played in the game c2, c3. Simply taking away the d4 square from black's king, not allowing black's king to escape, and setting up the threat of bishop f4 mate on the next move, to which black simply has no defense. There's no way to create an escape square, no way to block this bishop from reaching f4, and in this position black simply resigned as the mate is inevitable. So uh, not a super complicated game, but I, I always like this combination and the fact that it ended with such a devastating quiet move that would definitely elude a lot of players just taking away the escape square and setting up the mate uh, to black's king next. So for a little while, Zuckertort was considered uh, one of the best players in the world, if not the best player in the world. He uh, definitely had quite a few sparring matches with uh, Steinitz. And in fact, Zuckertort and Steinitz ended up playing the first official world championship match in 1886. Uh, now, Zuckertort actually started off quite well. He won four out of the first five games, losing uh, the other one, but he simply slowed down, and over the course of the match, Steinitz kind of proved to be the better player with more stamina. Steinitz ended up winning that match and thus becoming the first official uh, world champion. And when we cover Steinitz in the next video, of course, we'll be uh, discussing how Steinitz was able to kind of become the first undisputed world champion. Unfortunately, Zuckertort died quite early in his late 40s and wasn't able to have a full chess career, but for the time that he was active, he did produce a number of great brilliancies, had a lot of great uh, tournament performances, and was well known to be an expert in blindfold simuls, uh, with the ability to play over 10 boards blindfold against a number of players and winning most of those games. Uh, also, an expert in blindfold simuls is actually the other player uh, featured in this video, uh, Joseph Blackburn. So Blackburn was born in 1841 and was an English player and also considered one of the top five players in uh, the later part of the 19th century. He was actually nicknamed the Black Death, uh, referring to the plague uh, back then, uh, due to his uh, very, very large black beard and the fact that he would basically checkmate almost everyone uh, that he played. So he didn't perform that well against guys like Steinitz and Zuckertort, uh, but he was pretty much able to crush everyone else. And like I mentioned, he played a lot of these blindfold simuls as well, where he would often crush uh, 10 amateurs, uh, again, fully blindfold, not seeing any of the boards, uh, sometimes in really remarkable style. Uh, this first game here is one of his uh, better known games, and this was played in a blindfold simul in 1863. And uh, here Blackburn is playing white. Uh, he starts with uh, Gambit opening. This is the center game, uh, followed by c3, offering another pawn. Uh, black took this pawn, and here white goes bishop c4, offering yet another pawn if black is willing to accept it in order to develop the other bishop to b2. Uh, in this game, black doesn't take the second pawn, plays uh, d6 here, or I should say the third pawn on b2. Uh, white plays knight takes c3, knight c6, knight f3. In here, black makes a very questionable move, a knight e5. This is basically a game losing blunder, um, but the way Blackburn conducts this game, I think, is, is really fantastic and, and worth uh, studying. Uh, so white, of course, plays knight takes e5, d takes e5, and this has allowed a pretty typical tactic with bishop takes f7 check. Uh, the king can't take the bishop uh, on account of the queen on d8 hanging, so instead black plays the move king to e7, and already it's clear that black's position is somewhat busted. Uh, but the way white continues the attack, I think, is, is really strong. So he goes bishop g5 check, black is forced to play knight f6, uh, and now queen h5. This move was not really necessary. White is uh, defending the bishop and placing the queen on a somewhat precarious square, but of course the knight is pinned, so black is not able to play knight takes h5. I think a move like queen b3 was uh, 
perhaps objectively uh, stronger, just kind of defending the bishop from afar and not putting the queen in a somewhat precarious situation. But it didn't end up making such a huge difference. Uh, with white's last move, he is kind of threatening knight d5 check. Now that the bishop on f7 is defended, so black played c6, then followed rook d1, queen a5, and f4. Just trying to open more lines, open the position for white's pieces, and prepare some kind of mating attack against black's king. Uh, black played queen c5, kind of stopping white from castling, f takes c5, queen e5, and now castles, and now all of white's pieces are developed. Uh, he's not even a piece down, he's not even a pawn down, the, the position is really hopeless for Black. But again, the way Blackburn wins this game, I think, is, is really stylistic. So here Black plays the move h6, uh, hoping to take this bishop with the queen. And uh, White plays the move bishop to e8. Uh, very, very nice move, threatening queen to f7 check. Uh, other bishop moves were possible, like bishop b3 as well, and just a strong threatening uh queen f7, but bishop b8 I think is, is very aesthetic as the bishop cannot be taken. And uh, after bishop e6 as played in the game, uh, here comes the real brilliancy of, of white's play. Uh, he goes rook takes f6, sacrificing the first rook. Uh, black is essentially forced to take, g takes f6, and now rook d7 check, sacrificing the second rook. Uh, at this point, without rook d7, white's position would actually be falling apart, so anticipating this rook d7 move was, of course, very important, and this would be a good time to remind you guys that, again, this game was played blindfold. So, already it was kind of a remarkable game if it was played under normal circumstances, uh, but the fact that Blackburn couldn't even see the board as he was initiating and playing all of these tactics, not to mention playing at least nine other boards blindfold as well, uh, I mean, it's really a very, very impressive performance. Uh, so Black is forced to play bishop takes d7, and White's idea is queen f7 check. The point of rook d7 was to deflect Black's bishop away from covering this square. Now if Black's king goes back to d8, queen takes d7 will just be immediate checkmate, so Black's king is forced to go for a walk. Queen takes d7 check was played, king to c5, bishop e3 check, king to b4, Queen takes b7, white continues hunting the king, king a5, and here I think white had a couple of different wins, but Blackburn ends up finding uh, the fastest one. Uh, this would be another good exercise if you guys want to pause your video and try to find the fastest way for white to mate here, and that would be starting with the move b4 check. Uh, this forces black to play bishop takes b4, and this square is now somewhat covered by the bishop and taken away from black's king, and that allows white to execute the very nice finish with bishop b6 check. Black is forced to play a takes b6, and after queen takes a8, uh, black's king is mated, and we notice that the bishop on b4 is actually playing a very crucial role, again, cutting off the king's escape. White's knight cuts off the other squares, and we're uh, ending with this nice mate. Uh, so a really remarkable attacking game, once again, made uh, even more remarkable by the fact that it was played in a blindfold simul, and uh, yeah, definitely uh, very worthy of being one of the, the most famous games that Blackburn is known for, and in general, one of the most famous games of the Romantic era. The next game I want to uh, highlight from Blackburn's play, I think this was a uh, pretty typical game for Blackburn when he would play against other players and set up these really, really nice mating attacks. Uh, here playing white against uh, west, he starts with the move knight to e5. Uh, definitely a nice strategic idea. He's activating his knight and he's inviting his opponent to take on e5, which would allow his d-pawn to come to e5 hit Black's knight on f6 and force this knight away from the king's side. Black could have gone for this and played a move like knight to e4, trying to shut down white's bishop, but then white would probably follow with a move like c4, undermining the knight, opening up the position for the two bishops, and white would definitely enjoy a nice advantage here. Instead, after knight e5, black played the move bishop to e6. I think this move is quite questionable, uh, especially in view of white's next move, uh, f4. So securing the knight on e5, but really just threatening and hoping to advance f5, pushing this bishop away from e6, and then setting up a huge attacking uh, potential with bishop g5, and just trying to bring all of the pieces to the king side. So here black tried to move knight to e4, white pushes f5, and black first trades on e5 before moving the bishop away. Had black played bishop to d7 here, it's pretty likely white's plan was to take on d7, queen takes d7, and then push f6. 
just giving the pawn but trying to open up lines and open up black's king. Here if g takes f6, white probably continues queen h5, just starting to bring all of the pieces over to the king side, and this looks like a pretty crushing attack. Bishop h6 is coming, as well as all kinds of rook lifts, rook f3, rook f4, bringing the second rook over to f1, and yeah, there's no chance black's king is going to survive this. If instead black would play a move like knight takes f6, then white would probably sacrifice the exchange. Again, opening up black's king, really wrecking the pawn structure here with these double left pawns, and after queen h5, black has very little chances of surviving here. Uh, and lastly, after this move f6, in case of the response g6, we're going to see kind of a similar idea in the game. White would likely simply exchange off this knight on e4, d takes e4, and then play the move queen to d2. Earlier this square was of course covered by black's knight, that's why the exchange was necessary, and setting up queen h6 with potential mating ideas. Uh, so in the game, instead of just immediately going back bishop d7, black decided to first take on e5, d takes e5, and now play bishop d7, but nevertheless after f6, white's attack here is extremely strong. Uh, black played g6 here, just trying to keep things shut down. Uh, but now the dark squares around black's king are, of course, very weak. So white continues bishop a3, rook e8, and now just opts for the exchange, bishop takes e4. Uh, it wasn't necessary to play this move, but it's very understandable, just removing black's knight from controlling some squares on the king side, like f6 and g5. And now after d takes e4, queen to d2, white is again threatening to play queen h6 and set up this mate. Uh, so black played king h8, this is kind of the only way to defend against the incoming attack. And now I like the way Blackburn kind of finished things off. If you were to start with the immediate queen h6, this is a pretty useful idea for players to know. Black would of course defend with rook to g8. And now the typical winning plan for white in this type of position is to play the move rook to f4. Threatening not just rook h4, but actually an even more immediate queen takes h7 check king takes h7, and then rook h4 mate. But in this position, and in typical positions, a lot of times black has the defensive resource g5, which we should learn to watch out for, covering the h4 square and also opening up rook g6 in order to fend off white's queen. So instead of going for the immediate queen h6, blackburn plays queen to g5, stopping black's g-pawn from ever being able to push, and simply waiting to lift his rook with rook f4, rook h4, before going for this queen h6. I, I should mention actually another move that was just as strong was the move rook a d1, perhaps an even simpler way to win the game, uh, hitting black's bishop and threatening to play queen h6 in case black's bishop moves, uh, which would open up white's rook on the d file and just create a pretty much winning double attack. Nevertheless, after queen g5, black did not really have any real chances of defending here. Uh, they tried c6, rook f4 was played, queen to a5, and now white executes a pretty uh, typical mating combination starting with queen h6, rook g8, and of course queen takes h7, king takes h7, and rook h4. So unlike Zuckertort, Blackburn was actually able to have quite a long career, and he continued to play at elite levels all the way into the 1890s and the beginning of the 20th uh, century. Although he did run into the new generation of players, uh, players like Shigorin and Lasker and Tarash, and of course uh, faded off eventually eventually, but did have a very long and successful career for quite some time. Uh, with that, I'll be wrapping up this video here. If you guys want to check out uh, the games covered in this video, as well as all of the games covered in this series, uh, do check out the link to the Lee Chess Study, which is included in the description below. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Please do leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you guys next time. Take care.